Good evening, everyone. Thank you all for joining us tonight. Uh, we are excited to have our guest speaker with us this evening. But before we get started, I'd like to say a little bit about the organization who actually hosts these critical conversations. The Oncology Foundation of Maryland and the District of Columbia, which we so fun, we call it uh, OFMDC, right? Everything has an acronym, right? And OFMDC, the Oncology Foundation of Maryland and the District of Columbia, the mission is to bring together in a non-competing forum, patients, patient advocates, doctors, and the research industry to provide education and information on available cancer resources. After this session, we probably within a week or so, we will have the recording recording posted on the website. And we want all of you to share it for us because this is valuable information that people need to be able to access. And so if you can share it out for us, that would be great. You will receive it in your email as well. So I'm excited tonight to dialogue with our guest speaker. But before we start that, I want to tell you a little bit about Dr. Cesar Santamaria. He is an assistant professor of oncology at Johns Hopkins Sydney Kimmel Comprehensive Cancer Center. He is a breast medical oncologist. His clinical area of, re of expertise is in caring for patients with all types and stages of breast cancer. His research also focuses on patients with breast cancer with a special interest in developing new treatments using immunotherapy and investigating biological changes related to immunotherapy also that may help identify responders and improve treatment strategies. Dr. Santa Maria's work has been published in high impact peer reviewed journals, including the Lancet Oncology, the Journal of Clinical Oncology, Nature Center, JAMA Oncology, and the Journal of Immunotherapy of Cancer. Dr. Santa Maria has received numerous awards for his work involving immunotherapy, including from the National Institute of Health and the Breast Cancer Research Foundation. He serves on multiple task forces and focus groups, and his national recognition as a leader in breast cancer immune oncology has led to his involvement of the development of several potentially practice changing clinical trials. Few fun facts about Dr. Santa Maria. He speaks flu fluent, in, uh, fluent Spanish. He has three children, all girls and his family, he has some family in Greece. And so right now we welcome Dr. Santa Maria and he's gonna share some of his great content with you. And then after he finishes, he and I will dialogue a bit, but we would welcome you to please put questions in chat as he presents. Thank you. All right, thank you, Yolanda, for that very kind introduction. Um, and, and thank you to the organizers of, of this event for inviting me to talk. Um, it's really a pleasure to be with you guys um, this evening and, and talk about biomarkers. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. I've prepared a short slide deck just to maybe um, give a little bit of an introduction to biomarkers. And, you know, I'm gonna preface this by saying, am I, am I projecting the right screen? Okay, good. All right. Um, I, I I am a breast oncologist, so this is going to be essentially breast cancer focused. But hopefully, a lot of the themes, if you're interested in other types of cancers, um, do apply to to some extent. So, um, I, I guess just starting off, you know, well, what what exactly is a, a cancer biomarker? Um, you know, uh, these are essentially just markers on cells that can help us understand the biology of, of the cancer, and it can also inform us in terms of how, how to treat the specific cancer. So to really understand cancer biomarkers, I think you got to go to Biology 101. And, you know, I apologize if this is really uh, basic, but, you know, just thinking about um, uh, a cell, uh, you know, so like, like most uh, human cells, cancer cells are 
you know, they have this this membrane. I don't know if you can see my my mouse or if I can see. Does this let me pen and let's see laser pointer? All right. So um, you got the cell membrane, and inside the cell membrane um, of, of of a cancer cell, there's the cytoplasm, which is you know where that contains all the cellular contents, uh, and inside of that is is the nucleus, um, kind of in the usually in the middle or off to the center of a cell. Um, and that's where your DNA is housed. Your DNA is your genetic material. That's the, the blueprints um, to to you uh, or to the cancer in this case. Um, and, you know, the DNA forms um, a variety of different genes. And, you know, each gene um, sequence ultimately is um, uh, translated into a protein, which are the actual molecules in the in the cell that that do stuff. Um and there's kind of an in-between step um, where the DNA is converted to RNA. Um, this process is called transcription, um, which uh, and it's the RNA that ultimately actually gets uh, translated into to proteins. And proteins can take various different shapes and forms, and they do a variety of different things. Um, they can be inside of the cell cytoplasm. Um, you know, like like this little protein here, um, and um, an example of that perhaps is like the estrogen receptor. So in breast cancer, the estrogen receptor is is a really key biomarker. Um, some proteins can also be like on the uh, membrane of the cell, um, like this little protein here, um, and another another uh, protein that sits on the cell in breast cancers. In some breast cancers, is HER two. Uh, human epidermal growth factor receptor two new, and um, this 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 sits on the um, cell. And you know these are these proteins when they're activated, when um, they're stimulated, can um, tell the cell to do stuff, namely grow. So um, we're able to quantify um, the DNA, RNA, and protein. Um, to uh, uh, and look at specific markers to understand a little more about the cancer biology and um, and possibly how to how to target the cancer or if the cancer biology can tell us a little bit about how to treat the specific cancer. So when we think about DNA, you know, we think about uh, mutations and specific genes. An example for it is like the PA3K uh, mutation, uh, which I'll talk a little more about later. When we think about RNA, um, we can look at uh, different profiles of um, um, gene expression. You know, RNA is basically um, the expression of, of, a, of a specific gene. And um, we can um, develop scores and algorithms to um, uh, understand a little more about the, the cancer biology and it might inform us, you know, what kind of treatments would be appropriate. An example of a gene expression uh, uh, assay that we use commonly in clinic is the oncotype assay, which tells us a little bit about whether we need to use chemotherapy or not in certain patients. Um, and then, like I mentioned, your protein is kind of like the end product, which again, we can quantify. Um, um, and classic examples are like the estrogen receptor, the HER2 receptor. Another one is the, the pd one receptor. Um, so these uh, different biomarkers tell us about the biology of the cancer, um, but also uh, can tell us um, how, how to treat the, the cancer. So they're really important in that way. Um, so I'll delve into uh, genetic mutations a little further. Um, so when we think about genetic mutations, there's, there's a common misconception, well, you know, um, you know, you might hear terms like, you know, the BRCA mutation, then I talked about this other mutation called PIC3. Well, you know, how, how does that fit together and what exactly does that mean? So there, there, there's two types of genetic mutations that are, are relevant for, for patients with cancer. There's what we call germline mutations, which are basically mutations in your own genes. These are genes that can potentially be, that, that are, uh, they can be passed on. So they're, they can be hereditary. Um, and again, the most common uh, one related to breast cancer is gonna be the BRCA gene, which increases your risk of breast and ovarian cancer. Um, this can inform us about risk reduction strategies or screening strategies. It can also help us identify certain targeted therapies for patients who have BRCA mutations. 
So those are your genes. That's separate than the cancer's genes. Uh, the cancer has its own genome, and um, we call these uh, mutations in the cancer genomes somatic mutations. And we can identify these mutations by biopsying the tumor, but also certain cancers will um, will shed DNA into the bloodstream, and we can detect that in the blood as well. Um, actually, let me let me start with DNA biomarkers. Um, so we talked about um, you know uh, certain um, mutations are are in, in the patient themselves. And these are the, the germline mutations and BRCA mutations are the most common. There's two common BRCA mutations, BRCA1 and 2. And as you can see, um, in, in women, it increases the risk of breast cancer substantially, you know, between 40 to 65%. Um, BRCA2 is, is associated also with, with male breast cancer, um, but also other cancers as well. And, and importantly, ovarian cancer. Uh, BRCA1 in particular is associated with a high incidence of that. And knowing this information can tell you about your risk and potential risk reduction strategies like bilateral mastectomy sometimes or in cases of uh, reducing risk of ovarian cancer or removing um, your ovaries. Um, and in some patients, um, you can also consider uh, more intensified screening um, strategies using an MRI in addition to mammogram, for example, at, a, at an earlier age. So this is an example of a DNA biomarker. This is a germline biomarker, a mark, marker of, of yourself, um, of, the, of your own gene. So again, that's different than the somatic uh, mutations, which are the cancer's genes. And again, you can get uh, a, 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 this information by biopsying the tumor. So as my little arrow shows here, but um, as cancers die, they, they also shed um, DNA into the blood and we can also quantify that and we can characterize that and look at specific mutations. Some common mutations that you might see would be things like a PI3K mutation, an ESR1 mutation. These mutations have drugs that in certain settings and certain types of breast cancers um, can help us identify appropriate treatments for patients. So this is really helpful information to have. There's other uh, genetic mutations or genetic features that we can quantify tumor mutation burden, just kind of an assessment of how many mutations do, do these cancers have. And if, if you have a cancer that has a lot of mutations, sometimes you can use immunotherapy like pembrolizumab. Um, microsatellite instability is reflective of, of uh, abnormalities and how DNA is repaired and Again, you can use a, a pembrolizumab or an immunotherapy for, for patients with these cancers. Kind of going up a level to RNA uh, biomarkers, so gene expression biomarkers. The one that we commonly use in, in breast cancer care is the oncotype um, assay. Um, and this is looking at a variety of different genes in, in, a, in a breast tumor. So these are the tumor's genes, these are not yours. Um, and they look at different markers involved in proliferation, how fast cells are dividing, invasion, estrogen receptor signaling, HER2, um, and it comes up with a score. Uh, there's an algorithm that it spits out a score from zero to 100. And um, depending on that score in, in, in patients um, with hormone positive breast cancers, that can sometimes be helpful in understanding, well, how aggressive is the disease? And more importantly, what can we do about it? You know, is 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 my score high enough that it warrants considering chemotherapy, or is it low enough that I can skip over chemo? And um, you know, uh, this has been validated in patients with lymph node negative uh, disease, and 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 to a certain extent with lymph node positive disease as well. So, uh, in the bottom here, you can see, you know, for hormone positive uh, breast cancer that's lymph node negative. If you have a score that's basically less than 25 and you're postmenopausal, you don't need chemo. We know, we've done studies that looked at doing chemo or not, and there's no benefit to chemotherapy if your score is this low. Um, it's a little different if you're younger. Generally, breast cancers that occur in younger women are a little more aggressive, but there are cutoffs where you know, we can still um, use the score to, to potentially omit chemotherapy from uh, a treatment plan. So again, we're using a gene expression biomarker, an RNA biomarker, to help um, 
understand disease biology and make clinical decisions. And then I'll just finish with protein biomarkers, which, you know, when we think about breast cancer, we have these canonical subtypes of breast cancer um, where we look at specific receptors in the breast cancer cells, like the estrogen receptor, the HER2 receptor. These are receptors that are basically oncogenes. They tell the cells to grow. Um, and we have targeted therapies to these specific receptors. So if you your breast cancer overexpresses the estrogen receptor. We have anti-estrogen treatments like tamoxifen or aromatase inhibitors. If your breast cancer overexpresses HER2, uh, we have uh, drugs that target HER2. Remember, that's one that sits on the cell membrane. So we can use certain antibodies to, to, to target that, molecules that can bind the receptors and basically um, uh, flag the cell for destruction or... Um, help kind of uh, affect that uh, the way the receptor works, basically preventing it from working. Some of the newer drugs were using these antibodies, these targeted molecules, and we stick chemo onto it, what we call antibody drug conjugates, and we're able to deliver chemotherapy in a targeted manner to those cells. Um, and then there's small molecule inhibitors, basically pills um, that can uh, target uh, the receptor from kind of inside the cell. And if you don't have any of these biomarkers, what we call triple negative breast cancer, we still have biological therapies now that are available for, for patients, such as immunotherapy, pembrolizumab, and some of these antibody drug conjugates, these targeted antibodies that um, can deliver chemotherapy in a targeted way. Um, so I'm, I'm skipping around slides, but so kind of putting it all together, just an example, um, a, a clinical example of you know biomarkers in clinical practice. So we're gonna take an example patient, uh, Maria, who is a 42 year old woman who found a lump on her breast. She gets a biopsy and it shows that it's estrogen receptor positive or two negative. So she has a hormone positive breast cancer. She gets germline testing, then genetic testing. Um, usually this is like a saliva test or a blood test. And she's found to have a BRCA mutation, you know, and in young patients like this, we, we think about, you know, do, do you have a genetic predisposition for, for breast cancer? So. In this case, she did. Because of this, she opted to have a bilateral mastectomy, removing both breasts because of her increased risk of uh, a future breast cancer as well. And when they took the, the the tumor out, they found that it was small. It was a stage one node negative breast cancer. So she got an oncotype test done on the tumor. And again, this is a, a, a biomarker, a gene expression biomarker, which was low. So she was able to avoid therapy. And her treatment was basically just tamoxifen, an anti-hormone treatment that was based on another biomarker, the estrogen receptor biomarker. So this is some of the ways that we would use biomarkers in clinic to, to treat patients and optimize care. Um, so uh, this is the MD Anderson slogan, but I love it, making cancer history. So, you know, um, the reason we know how to use these biomarkers is because we've done lots of clinical trials to understand cancer biology better and how to target cancer better. So um, I do think that we live in a day and age where clinical trials are really part of modern oncology care. And, um, you know, if you've been diagnosed with um, cancer, you know, it's something that uh, certainly um, you can talk to your oncologist about how, how you can participate. And then my very last slide here is just the Hopkins Breast Medical Oncology team. We have sites in Baltimore and in Washington, and we have a, a large group of uh, wonderful colleagues of mine um, practice. So I will end it there, and I'd be happy to go for any questions. Thank you so much for that, Dr. Santa Maria. We did have one question in chat uh, so far. Uh, Amy asks, how is the recurrent score calculated? And are there cancers other than breast cancer for which the recurrent score can be calculated? All right, so I can answer some of that. Like I mentioned at the very beginning, <laughs> breast oncology only. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, but, um, so um, Oncotype is looking at 21 genes um, and it assigns it a score um, and you know, there's a there's a large complicated bioinformatic formula that um, and gives you the score from zero to a hundred. 
Um, basically, we use a score of anything that's 26 or higher as high, and that tells us the cancer is proliferative. It's dividing more quickly. It's a little more aggressive. We know the prognosis is not as good, but in addition to knowing in addition to the oncotype being a prognostic biomarker, it tells you information about the patient's prognosis. It's also a predictive biomarker. It's, um, you know, um, th the fact that it's high, we know that chemotherapy can help reduce that risk. So it's not only knowing the biology, knowing the prognosis, but being able to do something about it. Um, and um, that's so that, that's a little bit of how we, 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 we calculate the score and, and how we use it. Um, there are other gene expression platforms also through through Oncotype as well that are used in other cancers as well. Um, I believe there is a colon one and a prostate one, and I don't really know where they are in terms of clinical practice, but I know that they've uh, they they exist. Um, but um, yeah, uh, you know the the idea of using. Uh, a lot of different genes that give you a broad understanding of the disease biology um, is is something that um, gene expression um, biomarkers can can be helpful for. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I know um, I took some notes and I had several takeaways during your presentation, but one of them was related to the ability to utilize biomarkers to decrease or omit chemotherapy. Can you say a little bit more about that, Dr. Santamaria? Yeah, so, so this is the Oncotype biomarker. This is a biomarker that it's been studied in a specific patient subset. So it's been studied in patients who are hormone receptor positive. So this is a subtype of breast cancer, hormone receptor positive breast cancer, again, using a biomarker to define that subtype. Um, and um, it's, I would say, uh, particularly helpful on lymph node negative patients. Like we talked about, you know, and I showed in that slide, you know, if it's low in your postmenopausal, you can safely avoid chemotherapy. For premenopausal, there are some slightly different cutoffs that we might want to consider. Um, it has been studied in patients with even lymph node positive breast cancer. So even, you know, a, a higher risk kind of breast cancer, at least anatomically speaking. And this is really where, you know, um, anatomy versus biology are, are um, not always concordant. So you can have a node positive breast cancer, anatomically what we historically would consider a higher risk breast cancer. But if your oncotype is low, if your gene expression assay is low, even though you have a higher anatomical risk, the fact that your biological risk is lower, that drives prognosis more than anatomy. And um, particularly in postmenopausal women who have up to three positive lymph nodes, if your oncotype is low and your hormone receptor positive, you know you can safely avoid chemotherapy. Wow, I think that's huge. Um, and you know, I think it's safe to say that's one good thing about being postmenopausal. That's wonderful. Yeah. Um, so we had a couple questions in chat. Uh, does the rate of a tumor's growth relate to or relate at all to on oncotype uh, outcomes? Yeah, so um, that's a great question because there are other biomarkers that can um, evaluate growth or um, the aggressiveness of a tumor. Um, some of the older markers that we've looked at are, for example, grade. That's something that you might sometimes see on like on a pathology report, grade one, grade two, grade three. Um, grade three, meaning a more aggressive cancer, grade one, a more indolent. Another marker that we look at as well, uh, a marker of proliferation, how fast the cells divide is called KI67. And this is a marker that's not only in breast cancer, but in other cancers as well. Um, and it's a marker again, of how fast the cells are dividing. The higher the number, the higher it's dividing. And there is some concordance uh, between these pathological markers and oncotype scores. Um, we actually did a study at Hopkins that we kind of looked at um, different cutoffs of the estrogen receptor positivity, the progesterone receptor positivity, the grade, this KI67 marker. And we found that within our patient population uh, that we studied, um, we could we could actually predict oncotype scores pretty reliably. So um, there, there is some inter... Um, um, 
they are very much related. The nice thing about the Oncotype score, however, I would say it's it's very um, relatively reproducible um, and well validated. So it's probably the most validated biomarker, probably in all of medicine, but at least in oncology. Um, you know, the studies that validated this biomarker were international studies with, um, you know, 10,000 patients. So um, these were huge randomized trials that established these biomarkers. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, the liquid biopsy test that you mentioned, the blood test to test for cancer cells shed into the bloodstream by the tumor. How much does that cost and can anyone get that done? I believe that was um, Amy's question. Yeah, that's a great question, Amy. I think um, liquid biopsies are definitely a very hot topic right now. And I will say, I think, you know, we're starting to get some initial clinical um, um, applicability from this in breast cancer. Again, I'm not going to speak to other cancers because I really couldn't say. I, th I think other cancers that that use uh, circulating uh, tumor DNA, um, like in lung cancer, I think are more, it is more streamlined into clinical practice. In breast cancer, it's a little more, more limited. So um, there's a couple of considerations. So first of all, the mutational profile that we see in the blood doesn't always match the mutational profile in the tumor. So it's not exactly a complete representation, you know, whether it's a better representation or a complementary uh, representation of the actual tumor genome is a little bit unknown. But we have started to be able to use blood uh, liquid biopsies to identify certain mutations that can be potentially targeted. We got our first targeted uh, therapy that uh, was approved based on a blood uh, uh, test um, earlier this year, um, looking at ESR1 mutations, a certain type of uh, mutations in the estrogen receptor. And there's a, a drug that got approved based on, on, on patients who had an ESR1 mutation called LSS-Strand. But as an example of that, this is early days in breast cancer, you know, that study found that there was only a very modest benefit of LSS-Strand versus uh, a, a, a different kind of anti-hormone treatment. It was only by about two months that it was better. So it's early days in breast cancer, I think. I don't think, um, I think in certain circumstances it can be useful. Um, I don't think it's a one size fits all and it's something that necessarily everybody needs to be getting. But um, I do think that um, in, in the right clinical situation, it can be helpful, um, but uh, not, not a one size fits all yet. <laughs> Okay. Yeah. Pam has kind of a, um, she has two pieces, uh, two questions. First, how recent is the discovery of biomarkers in cancer care for treatment? And then the second is, is does this support the case for genetics testing as a cancer screening tool, if that's something that you can answer? Yeah. So biomarkers have been around for a while. Um, you know, I mean, breast cancer is a great example of how, um, you know, the the history of understanding this disease over centuries has really led to our a better understanding of the biology that we can now target. So if you rewind to like the late 1800s, George Beetson, uh, an English surgeon, uh, found that, you know, um, in patients with breast cancers, if you remove the ovaries, sometimes the breast cancers would shrink. You know, ovaries make estrogen. They, they knew that. So, you know, um, that gave us a clue that, you know, estrogen may somehow be related to breast cancer growth. And through, you know, studies over decades from that, you know, um, we were able to identify the estrogen receptor and start developing targeted drugs about that. That, that, that initial discovery of the estrogen receptor, I think it was like in the 70s, um, you know, led to the development of tamoxifen. That was our first targeted therapy in breast cancer, um, also in the 70s, 80s. Um, and, you know, that that's really changed the, the treatment paradigm. And we've, we've built on that substantially. So, um, you know, um, biomarkers are something that have been discovered over the last few decades. And I think only now are we really understanding them well enough that we can develop a very effective drugs uh, based on those biomarkers. 
Sure. Um, and then the second question was, does it support the case for genetic testing as a cancer screening tool? Yeah. Um, the short answer is yes. Uh, well, uh, in, in, in certain circumstances. So, you know, I, I think that, um, you know, are we at a point where we can just get a blood test and know if we have cancer or not? No, is a short answer to that. Uh, but the genetics can be helpful in um, how we approach cancer screening. Okay, and that that's kind of like the, the BRCA mutation story, right? If you have a BRCA mutation, your risk of a breast cancer is so high that can affect you know the way you screen for breast cancer, whether it's MRI, mammograms, at what age you start, um, and um, you know, there are some things you can do to not only screen, but potentially prevent breast cancers, like in certain cases, doing a bilateral mastectomy, for example. So, um, you know, genetics in that sense, you know, I think is can, can certainly influence screening. But, um, you know, because I, I know your question was tied to the, the liquid biopsy, you know, are we at a point where we can just do a blood test and, know, oh, do we have cancer or not? Not, not, not quite. Still got to do mammograms for breast cancer. Um, this is a question that's kind of related to prostate cancer, so I don't think that you can answer this, but just to um, let you know, it says, if you happen to know, what type of biopsy does an oncologist usually order for metastatic, met metastatic I apologize, prostate cancer? I, I think these will usually be tissue biopsies. Um, you know, I, I, I don't know the, the current literature of 